Good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 National Teachers Hall of Fame Roundtable featuring the five Class of 2020 inductees. The annual roundtable is a highlight each year as the nation's leading educators respond to national, state, and local issues that impact student learning. For the next 90 minutes, we have a set of questions for the panel of inductees to respond to and discuss. I am Ken Weaver, past chair of the Hall of Fame's Board of Trustees and host for today's roundtable. This roundtable will be live streamed and archived for future viewing by educators across the country. Emporia State University's Teachers College will provide digital badging so that viewers can use this for professional development points in their districts. To learn more, please contact the Hall of Fame. The National Teachers Hall of Fame is very appreciative of the support of the College Football Playoff Foundation, Emporia State University, and the Teachers College at Emporia State for making this roundtable possible. We are especially proud to be included in the College Football Playoff Foundation's Extra Yard for Teachers Week and their big day today as they honor educators across the country. Inductees, please join me in tipping your caps to the College Football Playoff Foundation. Let's meet our participants who bring 150 years of teaching experience to today's roundtable. Andrew Bider is an eighth grade social studies teacher at Springville Middle School in Springville, New York, with 28 years of teaching experience. Dr. Melissa Collins is a second grade teacher at John P. Freeman Optional School in Memphis, Tennessee, with 24 years of teaching experience. We have a little bit of a technical glitch with Melissa and we're working to, to get her connected back. Donna uh, Cradell is, uh, Cradle is a 10th to 12th grade environmental science teacher from Broken Arrow High School in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Now Dean of Academics and Innovation at Summit Christian Academy in Broken Arrow with 35 years of teaching experience. Thomas Nabb is a K through four visual arts teacher at Dodge Elementary in East Amherst, New York, with 34 years of teaching experience. Jamil Siddiqui is a ninth through 12th grade math teacher at East Bridgewater Junior Senior High in East Bridgewater, Massachusetts, with 29 years of teaching experience. We are so grateful to each of you for sharing your thoughts and expertise with us today. Andrew, we will start with you answering first and then proceeding through the members of the panel in alphabetical order by last name, ending with you, Jamil. There will be time to discuss after all members have responded. Who responds first will rotate using the same alphabetical order. So you will answer first, Melissa, if you're here, and if not, Donna, it'll be you. Um, for the second question, and Andrew, you will respond last. Let's get started with the first question. You have each been in the classroom for more than two decades. So there must be something that keeps you there. What do you find most rewarding about your teaching career? Andrew? Ken, thank you. And it's great to be with everyone today uh, coming here from North Buffalo, New York. And the simple answer is that we get, we get as teachers far more than we give. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's obvious that we're there to instruct and, uh, you know, all our disciplines, but the bottom line is that we get paid to love and support people. And, you know, two small anecdotes came up today, why our profession is so rewarding. And one came, you know, from a boy who said he struggled a lot during COVID. And I teach, you know, 13 year olds, eighth graders here in New York. And he said, you know, he said he was so challenged and so full of anxiety at times. But when he came into my classroom, he felt that love and he's felt support. And he said he had a sense of confidence that he didn't have in, in quarantine. And just that alone, you know, you know, really reinforced my my belief that being a, t a teacher is one of the most special jobs on the planet, if not the most. I'm sure there, there's other professions that uh, live contributory lives. But in the end, you know, uh, if we do our jobs well, Ken, people are going to remember our names for the rest of our lives. And that's a privilege, a huge responsibility, but also a joy. And the second anecdote that happened today was, you know, I've known a student for a while and he came in and I said, you know what, you'd be a good psychologist. 
and he took uh, and I, I sent him a career aptitude test and he came back and he's like, you know, Mr. Biter, how did you know uh, the, the scores came back that I'd be a great social worker? And just the fact to touch somebody's life like that and to be a role model is such a joy and it, it's incredibly rewarding. And, you know, hearkening back to a year ago today when we were told that we were the latest inductees in this incredible institution. Um, you know, I, uh, the first person I called was my fifth grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Brompton, who loved and supported me after my mother died. And, you know, I try to be like her and all the other great teachers that I've, I've, I've had in my life. And, you know, again, I think we all get far more uh, than we give. Uh, so that's the short story. But, you know, the first week back here in New York has been a joy and totally reinforcing. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and uh, Donna, your response. Well, I uh, appreciate everything that Drew said and agree with him completely. I'd like to add to that just by saying that it's an adventure. Um, I think the reward, one of the rewards of teaching is that no two days are the same. So every day has the potential to be something that you, you know, never dreamed of or something that you did dream of. And you get to do this by guiding and alongside of young people who have so much energy and so much passion. And that keeps, it's kept me young for all these decades. I think the other thing, in addition to uh, what Drew mentioned, was, is also today, the, the opportunities for teachers are just limitless. You can come up with ideas and you can be as innovative as you want and you can run with it. And the opportunities for support, like to travel, to have fantastic professional development, to take your students, to uh, allow them to be global citizens, allow them to work on problem solving and you know, be world changers and you're there with them. It's, it's just something that is, it's just always, it's always an adventure. And then I think the other thing is that to be someone's champion, kind of what Drew was saying. And I go back to my own childhood when, um, you know, in the seventies and middle school, I was, you know, loved basketball, but there was no basketball team. And the boys basketball coach, will open the gym for everybody in the morning and he saw my ability and since there was no girl team he decided to put me on the boys team and sooner or later what came about was a girls team was formed but that having that opportunity and him seeing my potential regardless of my gender just catapulted me into a really good high school career and eventually that's how i went to uh, college was on a basketball scholarship so providing and being a champion, we get to be champions for our students. And as Drew said, we can see their potential sometimes when they can't. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Very nice. Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, Emporia State University, um, the College Football Playoff Foundation, and of course, the National Teacher Hall of Fame for putting together this uh, roundtable today. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I think what's kept me uh, going in education, and I've taught the little ones, K to four, for I think I'm in my 34th year now. Um, the excitement students have when you introduce them to something new, and uh, just that excitement alone, even though I've introduced it so many times to them, it's brand new and it's exciting. Um, seeing students then take that and um, what you've given them and applying it somewhere else in their life. They'll, they'll come into school and say, um, I've done this on my own, or they wanna show me an artwork they've created, um, or they've connected it to something they're doing within their classroom. Um, I also think, um, kind of connected a little bit to what Donna said, the opportunity to innovate and reinvent what we do. There's always that opportunity um, to do things a new way, a better way, a different way, um, which keeps it um, exciting um, in our careers. And I think um, also like connected to that, um, just the, or just the uh, um, what I've built 
uh, uh, to the side of my teaching career is my uh, like professional organizations and the ability to contribute to those is also very exciting, very rewarding, and both those together, uh, we get a lot of very positive feedback from the students and from colleagues. Um, so that makes it really, uh, I found a really wonderful place uh, to live a lot of my life within my classroom. And I find it's just, I come to life when I walk into my classroom, um, um, even if I'm dragging or whatever, um, it's just such a different experience. So I think that's uh, what's kept me going all these years. Thank you so much, Thomas. Jamil? Um, you know, first of all, you know, just thanks for having us. This is a great opportunity. It's, it's been so exciting getting to know the other the other members of the inducting class, and it's just great to, to be a part of this. I look forward to actually meeting everybody in person. Um, but a, as for the question, I, I think it comes down to one word. I think all of us have, have reiterated it. It, It's students. It, it's all about students. Um, we get to this profession because we want to help people, and nobody goes into teaching for 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 the vacations, although that's what people think. We, we, we do it because we wanna make a difference. We wanna help people. And you know, Drew was telling stories about, about previous students who, who was talking. Uh, I've got one that I was gonna tell. It's about, about one of my former students was my second year teaching. Her name was Katie. And I teach high school math. I teach the advanced math classes at my school. And Katie was very reluctant to take my class. She felt she wasn't quite up to the, the challenge. She felt her background wasn't strong enough. But she came to talk to me about it, and I, I kind of encouraged and I said, look, you're going to come, you're going to give your best effort, and that's what we're going to do. Whatever your best effort is, is going to be success. So please, you know, come and take it. And, and she, she struggled with that, but she did. And she would come after school every day. She'd go, out, she'd go to practice, cross-country practice. She'd come afterwards, and she'd be all sweaty from, from practice, but she'd be working hard and trying to get better and better at math each day. And there were days that she felt good, but there were – probably more days in the beginning where she felt defeated and I like she wanted to give up. And I remember one day in particular, she came to me, it was probably, you know, middle of late October. And she's like, you know, Mr. Siddiqui, I, I, I wanted to do this, but I just don't think it's right. I think, I think it's too hard for me. And I basically just looked at her and I said, okay, that's nice. Here's your tissue. I'll see you tomorrow because you're not giving up. There's no way you're giving up because you're going to prove to yourself that you can be successful. And I know you can be successful and together we're going to work hard. Well, she continued the year and she finished the class off and, and she did find a lot, a lot of success uh, taking the AP exam, getting college credit. But but the real the real exciting part of the story was for, for me is like with so many students, I kept in touch with her uh, for the first couple of years after they graduate. And then it just it just gets harder. It gets harder and harder to keep in touch. So we had lost track of each other. And about 10 years later, I got an email from her and she said, I just wanted to let you know that I defended my doctorate today. I got my Ph.D. And. I was going to go to school for art, and I loved art, and, and people told me I was good at it, but my real passion was science, and I never thought I could be good at science. But then I took your class, and I realized that if I apply myself, I, I, can, I can be successful. That was like, to this day, I, I'm still getting goosebumps right now just thinking about that story, because it, it wasn't about me. It was about her determination and me just being there to assist her and to support her. And to, and to just show her that we're going to do this and we're going to do it together and we're going to be successful. And to me, that's really, really what I love the most about teaching is, you know, again, teaching math. In mathematics, people have very strong feelings. They either love math, it seems, or they hate math. But I get a lot of students that come to me and they're, they're on one end of the spectrum not liking math. But on the days they get it, the looks in their faces when they finally get it right, it, it, it's just so invigorating to see them get excited. And it makes me feel... Like I'm helping them, helping convince them that they can do something they thought was impossible. And for me, there's no greater feeling than, than, than doing that and, and helping students. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I Drew also mentioned previous teachers in our lives. You know, I can look back. I can look back at Mr. Hunter and Mr. Daigle in high school. I can look back at Professor Devaney and Professor Wilcott in college. And without them, I wouldn't be where I am because they saw someone who was willing to work hard, struggling, and they did everything they could to help and support me. So part of my job is to pay that forward with my students and make sure that they have every opportunity and be there to help them. And then the, the last two things I want to mention, you know, why you keep coming back. Uh, my first year teaching, I was 23 years old. I was starting teaching. My next door neighbor, Harry Farrellock, was, I think, uh, 48. And I looked at him like an old man then. Little did I know that 48 wasn't that old. When you're 23, it seems kind of old. And we were talking one day, and he said to me, the best thing about teaching and Don, I think you mentioned this, is, is you, you always feel young. 
And the reason for it is every year you go in and your students stay the same age. My kids, every year, they're, they're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. They never, never change. So psychologically, I feel like I'm still 23 because they're not changing ages. So, so why would I? Um, so that was one thing I remember that he told me. And then the last thing I want to share with everybody that's been one of the biggest things that keeps me coming back. Um, I have a passion for my subject. I love to share it with my students. I'm, I'm very proud to say that 18 of my former students are now high school math teachers. And we get together every summer and we talk about math. And we talk about how the classes go. And it's funny to, to meet with them because they range in age from 22 to 42. But they're all my kids. They're all my students. And I'm just so proud of what they've been able to accomplish. And that's what keeps me motivated and coming back for more. Thank you, Jamil. Very, uh, what a legacy for all of you. So we had this time after everyone has gone through answering the question, uh, the question to uh, share anything else, respond in any way. Uh, no, no, no pressure to do so. But if you have something else you'd like to say, uh, please, this is a great time to do so. Otherwise, we'll move to the second question. So inductees. Oh, Dr. Collins, you are you are here. So yes. <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, uh, again introduce, this is Dr. Melissa Collins uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. I gave your introduction uh, earlier. Uh, I'm so happy that we've got the technology figured out. Let me, uh, let me uh, ask you the question that the other four inductees ha have already answered. Uh, okay. So you have been in the classroom for more than two decades. So there must be something that keeps you there. What do you find most rewarding about your teaching career? Yes. So in 1999, I returned back to my community uh, to teach and I find joy in working with the schools, with the students in that community. And I get a chance to make their dreams a reality. And so I find that rewarding when I get to implement programs to help them have a bright future. For instance, I believe STEM is for all. I implemented a future leaders of STEM club for those students. And we have a white coat ceremony for those members. Also, I stay because my principals, I've had different ones uh, throughout my uh, time of teaching. And all of them have been very supportive of allowing me to be uh, Melissa and uh, demonstrate their learning each and every day in my classroom. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and so I, I, all, all five of you truly inspirational and we just finished the first question. So let's go ahead and go to the second question. Melissa, you'll start us off on this one. Okay. We have seen a fairly large percentage of teachers leaving the profession during their first three years of teaching, even before the pandemic struck. What factors cause early career teachers to leave the profession and what can be done to reverse this trend? Melissa? Uh Yes, uh, we are seeing a lot of early career teachers leaving at an alarming rate, uh, which is very disheartening. And a lot of them are leaving because they don't know what's expected of them. Uh, the workload can be very demanding uh, to new teachers. And so I think it's very important that teach prep programs allow teachers, the early career teachers, to get that authentic experience so they understand what it's like in the classroom. Also, a lot of early career teachers are leaving too because they feel they can't really uh, implement what they've been taught in the teach pro programs. And this is also because of the expectations. You may have 80 things off the list that they have to check, check off and do and so it's hard for them to sit down and plan for those authentic, innovative uh, experiences that they learn in the teach prep program. So that can be very frustrating to them. And so, uh, and also administrators are always coming in, not necessarily to talk to the early career teachers, just to see how they're doing, but you going through the evaluation process. And so I feel that administrators need to grant those early career teachers grace. Think about how much they're putting on their plate, not just coming in their room to observe uh, the new teachers, but to talk to them, get to know them, just as they encourage teachers to get to know their students. And um, 
And those are just a few uh, suggestions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Donna? Well, um, my teaching career, I started in the 80s. So really it spanned five decades. Um, and I remember when I first started, you know, you're one of the biggest problems was the dust from the chalkboard. And then the next decade, it was the overhead projector. And then it was, you know, moving into technology and everything because technology moves so quickly and information is so available, it moves so quickly and everything moves so fast that it's very difficult for educators to feel as though they're adequate to where um, in presenting things, I think, particularly on, I think, the secondary level. Um, and just the amount of access that students have to information and to technology. What they bring into the classroom is base knowledge. And we as educators need to find how to make that relevant and how to involve them and engage them. And it requires a tremendous amount of energy. I think that teachers are probably one of the worst groups for feeling as though they never accomplish what they want to. And I always tell new teachers, you're not going to because we want to have every one of our students uh, be completely successful every single day, behave uh, the way we want them to behave, be engaged, to enjoy learning. And there are just, that's just not going to happen. But yet those are our expectations. I think also that the social, emotional, and the trauma um, has really uh, made it much more difficult in some situations to reach the students that we so desperately want to reach. And therefore, that's very stressful for teachers. Um, it's It's been, the last two years have been tremendously stressful and um, for a lot of reasons. But I, I think that what I echo what Melissa said, great. Uh, teacher prep programs. I think mentorships with um, more experienced teachers that understand what you're really capable of achieving in the classroom. I think that allowing teachers to pursue some of the things that they're very passionate in the class keeps you, uh, you know, your fire and your passion going. And um, so those are just some of the things that I would suggest. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. Thomas? Yeah, I think in uh, um, talking to um, various teachers' experiences, um, I think there is some who, when you're a new teacher, in some situations, they might give you actually the toughest classes that other teachers, the more senior teachers, don't want, which is really the opposite of what should be happening. They should give you a chance to get your footing and uh, to keep developing your skills um, classroom management and those type of things um, to, to give you a chance, you know, to grow in, in your beginning years. I also think that um, uh, there's a uh, lack of support sometimes, um, whether it's, you know, the lack of the supplies or the books that you need. Um, and we know teachers are always trying to fill in those gaps, um, students that need things. Um, sometimes class size can be a big challenge too um, when you're thrust into it and, you, and you've got uh, uh, an overwhelming amount of students um, and you're trying to keep up with not just the teaching, but all of the administrative um, responsibilities that come with your job as well. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, uh, with that uh, lack of support, it could be, you know, the facilities aren't really designed mm -hmm. for the number of students you have or what you're trying to do like me as an art teacher a lot of times you just put it in a room it's not necessarily an art room um so there's those challenges um i also think sometimes teachers just don't feel valued in what they're doing whether it's you know uh, administration or the community or whatever and uh the all the as was mentioned earlier you know, the hard work that goes into being a good teacher um if you're not really feeling that value uh, from those you're offering it to, you might decide to do something else. So I, I think those things um, could impact uh, teachers deciding to, you know, leave the profession. Good. Thank you, Thomas. Jamil? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the big things that comes into play with this question is finding a correct work-life balance. Um, you know, Donna and, and, and Tom and, and Melissa all mentioned how, how, how much work goes into teaching. And especially, especially in the beginning of your career when you're establishing yourself and you're not only learning the art of teaching, but you're still, you're still really mastering your, your material as well. You're trying to get your subject down. You're trying to make sure that you're, 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 you're teaching correctly. So I think new teachers especially find themselves working all day, going home, and then staying up all night prepping for that next day's class. And that is draining. That's very difficult to sustain for a long time. So I think it was Melissa that had mentioned, you know, preparing teachers for, for how much work goes in and teaching them how to find that correct work-life balance. I think that is crucial for teachers feeling feeling good about what they're doing and feeling energized. The, the other thing I want to bring up is that I think we have to create a culture in schools where it's okay for teachers to fail. And let me, let me make, make sure I, I'm clear about that. If I'm a new teacher and I'm trying something new, I wanna be in a culture where I'm supported, I can try something new without having to worry about it going perfectly. If you think about how I educate my students, I'm sure all of us educate our students, we create a space that's safe for them to try new things. And if they aren't successful, we congratulate them for trying and we take what they did do that was good and build on that. And I think all too often teachers feel like they have to be perfect. I think as Melissa, you mentioned the expectations and Donald, I think you did too. There's this expectation that we're in front of the room, so we have to be like right on perfect at all times. And we, it's such a double standard. We, we tell our students that the best way to learn is to try and fail and get better. But teachers don't have that kind of culture where they feel like they can be that way. I think it's incredibly important that schools work to create that culture where teachers feel like they can grow and don't have to be perfect each day and just get better each day. Because again, like I said, my students all know that's all I ask from them. Every day you're a little better. As long as you get incrementally better each and every day, you're gonna be successful. You're gonna reach your goals. And I don't think teachers get that feeling. I, I, I just, I think I said before, it's just, it's too big of a double standard. If it's good for our students, it's gotta be good for our teachers as well. Thank you, Jamil. Andrew? You know, I would I would concur with with all the great comments here, you know, but but Ken, I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the power of teacher unions and retaining teachers and making sure that they have livable salaries. To me, you know, it's it's just criminal that so many states have starting salaries under 50,000. And while I know we have privileged jobs with, you know, at times really good benefits, the cold fact is that a lot of our colleagues around the country have to coach, have to do extracurriculars, have to have extra jobs, just so they can, you know, be in the position of educating our future. You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, so one, you know, unionization and making sure that they're getting that, the teachers are getting that economic support. But second, I think our current structure of schools is a square peg in a round hole. Um, teachers shouldn't be doing 10 periods a day and watching the kids at lunch. Um, you know, the research shows that block education, you know, having four 90 minute periods perhaps is easier on the kids. And guess what? It's easier on us as well. And that would diminish the stress. It would diminish the hustle and bustle of the day and allow people to really concentrate. Third, we have so much to learn from our European colleagues and their systems where they get paid sabbaticals every five years where there are higher standards, of course, higher salaries, but they get that support to keep themselves, you know, focused and, and cutting edge. You know, so I, I think when you look at all those things, it all goes down also to student teaching. The fact that we throw, you know, 21 year olds in front of a bunch of 12 year olds for five weeks, and then a bunch of 16 year olds for another five weeks is also criminal. Student teaching needs to be a paid opportunity, Ken. It needs to be a year-long process with master teachers. It's the most important job in civilization, but yet we don't treat it as such. And lastly, I think, you know, I'm not blaming the victim here because I think everyone on the screen at one point wanted to quit and perhaps didn't. But I think one thing that goes into this are the subtle cues that kids pick up along the way. In New York State, we have advanced science and math in seventh and eighth grade. So our best and brightest kids immediately hop in those lanes. But we don't have advanced social studies or English, and we certainly don't have future teacher clubs as much as we should. So our best and brightest immediately get on an on-ramp towards STEM. 
Now, STEM is important. This forum, this technological forum, you know, was created by people with advanced science and math degrees. But man, we need to plant those seeds to capture our best and brightest to go into the classrooms. If we don't, we'll pay for it in the future. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, five amazing responses. Any any comments anybody wants to add or you know respond to another inductee's response? All right. So thank you. Thank you, panel. Just a, just a fabulous job. So let's go to our third question. And Donna, you will get us started. Define the characteristics or traits of an effective principal or teacher leader. Donna? Well, I've had a lot of administrators through the years, and I've had some tremendous administrators. And so I'm going to glean some of the things I learned through them. And then I'm going to also uh, tell you some of the things I've learned in the last two years uh, in my administrative position. I think that probably the most important thing is that you are genuine. And by genuine, I mean sincere and genuinely concerned about your staff. I think that if you take the time, which I know is very difficult, particularly in larger school districts and particularly with COVID now, but if you can have the time to get to know your teachers and be in the classroom as much as possible and then find their strong points and then encourage them in those areas to just take a, take a leap. Go ahead and try that project. Go ahead and try that. Go ahead and try that technique, that method and encourage them. I think in being an encourager is tremendously important as a leader, encouraging the good things. And then also encouraging, you know, you go into classrooms sometimes and you see, um, some areas where maybe teachers aren't as strong as you would hope they were going to be. Uh, but in that way, you encourage them towards becoming better and more efficient in those areas. And you can do that in many ways. Most of the time, I like to partner them up with another teacher who I see is is very um, an expert in those areas and has had a lot of experience and also has the personality that will allow them to grow alongside of them and help them mentor them. And then I think the last thing, um, or the third thing, there's many, but I think that a really good leader needs to be a good listener. I think they need to listen to what your staff is saying and also what the students are saying and what the community is saying. I think you learn a lot from the stakeholders and a lot from your staff and then try to find ways to make those things possible and encourage them to have a voice. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. Thomas? Yeah, thank you. I will. Uh, I think I'll just continue on um, what Donna just mentioned. I had uh, kind of written down. You know, one of my things was listening. You know, and and listening to your uh, your staff, your faculty, and uh, you know, just finding out. You know, not. Uh, or I'm sorry. Finding out what's going on in in their areas, right? What needs they might have. I think, and it's important as well as what's going on in their personal life. So you can have an understanding of the challenges that they could be facing at any point in their lives. Um, I think it's very important for uh, an administrator or a leader to value other professionals uh, or other teachers' professionalism. You know, trust them in that they know what they're doing. Um, and at the same time, to balance that, have empathy. Uh, to offer help when it's needed or when it's warranted. Don't just be the leader, the administrator that I'm here to evaluate you. You know, uh, we're a team. I'm here to support you and work with you. Um, I think it's important for them to have an interest and a knowledge in what you're doing too. As an art teacher, sometimes I felt like I had an administrator who didn't really know the art world and art teaching. And there's other special areas too um, that um, I think, you know, trying to find out Okay, how do you do what you do, you know, with all these art supplies and all these students and storage needs and, you know, so they have an understanding. Um, and I think the last thing I might add in is uh, transparency. If you're going to make a decision that impacts me, include me in the decision making, you know, so we don't have to come back and revisit because there's something you didn't realize that I already knew. 
So I think those are some some good qualities of a, a leader or an administrator. Good. Thank you, Thomas. Jamil? Yeah, I think being a good administrator, being a good principal, a lot of it is the same as being a good teacher. It meant building relationships. You know, as a teacher, we want to build relationships with our students so we know best how best to support them. You know when they're having good days and when they're having bad days. I, th I think administration needs to seek that kind of relationship with their teachers. The more uh, relationships are built, the, the better the collaboration is, the better the culture is. Um, another thing, and, and Tom, I, I, I think you mentioned it. Teachers want to be included. Teachers want to feel valued. Teachers want to be a part of decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very, very difficult for teachers to just have a decision passed on to them without them understanding how it came about. You know, we're not always going to agree. Not everybody in every school building is going to agree 100% on everything. But if we understand how the decision was made, we can accept that. We can, we can, we can understand it. We can respect it. You know, and that, that's a big part. Um, Another really big piece in my world is um, just communication. You know, letting teachers know what's happening. Uh, there have been times in my career, previous administration, where I would find things out from parents in town. I live in the town where I teach, and the parent would mention something to me. I have no idea what they're talking about, but parents knew about it before teachers did. Teachers need to be communicated with. They need to know what's going on. And the last thing, and I think I think Donna mentioned it earlier. Believe in your teachers. Believe in your teachers. I mean, when I when I first was applying for jobs, I sent out so many applications, got so many rejections, and then the one place where I ended up in East Bridgewater, George Kelly was my he was my assistant principal. Then he became my principal the very next year, and he just took me aside. He took me aside after my interview and just started talking to me. He says, "You're going to be a good fit here. I can just tell. I know you're going to fit here." And what an impact it had on me because after having so many rejections to have someone pull me aside who just knew me for 20 minutes after my interview, basically, and say, I can see you're going to do great things here. And sure enough, I came back, I, I took the job and every year I had him as a principal. He was like, tell me what you need. Let me help you reach as many students as you can and be successful. And he believed in me when, you know, a slew of other teachers didn't even take, I'm sorry, administrators didn't even take the time to, to, to interview me. And I said to myself, I'm not going to let this guy down. I mean, this guy went out for me. I'm going to make sure that he never regrets that decision. And George, if you're listening, I hope you never have because you had that kind of impact on me. So those, those are some of the thoughts I have on that question. Great, great. Thank you, Jamil. Andrew? You know, I'd like to double down on my comments before about, you know, and making sure that our teachers get, you know, uh, the economic uh, incentives to stay in the classroom. Man, that's, that's even more true with our administrators. In the age of digitalization and email, our principals are doing more with less time. And every building in the country needs an extra administrator, almost just to handle email and public relations. I mean, our poor administrators were, were flooded with sometimes even violent concerns about mask wearing and COVID policies, and we're not alone. So, you know, the, the, the best thing we could do to make a great principal or a great superintendent is make sure that they get the support. And the first thing that's cut in most school budgets is the vice principal. And that puts additional stress on the, on, on the principal. And I would agree with everything everybody's saying here, but none of that's going to happen if our principals are short staffed. So assuming we get that perfect world of a well-staffed administrative building, then I would need my principals to be self-actualized confident in their own skin, and also willing to sign off on teacher training. And the best, the best administrators, uh, you know, I've had, Ken, are ones that have taken out their pen and said, go do it. You know, go get that training. We'll pay for the sub. We'll pay for the flight. We'll pay whatever you need because what you're doing is really important. So, you know, those characteristics of, of being audacious, of being supportive, of being loving. I mean, being a principal is perhaps one of the hardest jobs in the country. We need to give them our, our, the, the support that they deserve because a school and our jobs are only as good as the person on top. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Melissa? Yes. Um, I think it's important for a leader to be a motivator. And being in a position of authority, principal must know how to motivate their teachers. I can remember when I first started uh, teaching, my principal 
always motivated me to do more. And it gave me the strength to do more for my students and for myself. Uh, and, and my first principal was uh, Georgia Lane Park. And I remember I was on a pathway of being an administrator. So I do have my administrative degree. And I, I, I was thinking about doing the national board process. And she was like, Melissa, you need to really look into that process. And so when I looked at, at it, I was a little nervous because I knew that it would force me to be courageous. And that's another great characteristic for a teacher leader, taking that risk for yourself and for your students. And so I was nervous about the national board process because I knew I was going to have to start collaborating with all stakeholders. And what the teacher prep program taught me to do really well was engaged with my students and families and with my colleagues, but not talking uh, to administrators or community members to support students learning. And so when I went through that process, it really changed me. It made me stay in the classroom because I knew that I could thrive as a teacher leader. And so I think great principals and great teachers are wonderful motivators because we need teachers to motivate their peers, uh, students, and families. And so it's like a, a sword. We all need each other, a double jagged sword, and we're iron sharpens iron. And so it's very important to be a motiv motivator. And also it's important to be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, supportive, uh, supportive of your families, supportive of the students and teachers, and so that they can best serve the school community and do what's best, uh, most importantly for students. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, so any additional can, uh, comments, panel members? Yes, Thomas. I will. Uh, Jamil's comment made me uh, think back to uh, one of my very first principals who hired me for my second position where I've been ever since for 33 years. Um, after um, my interview and offered me the job and all that, and he told me, he said, you know, you had a really bad interview. He <laughs> said, but I student taught at that school too. He said, we knew what you could do. And so what a motivator for me to be like, I'm going to keep doing what I did and even work harder to show you that you made that right decision. And, you know, not judging people on that 20 minute span of an interview. You know, some people are great interviewers and they're not so good in the classroom and vice versa. So that made me think of that little anecdote. Thank you, Thomas. Any other comments? Ken, I would right. say, uh, go ahead. I would say, you know, uh, a great administrator in the end needs to be forgiving because there's such a steep learning curve in our profession. All new teachers are going to screw up and, you know, there's such demands and we're in such a fishbowl in our digitized world that it's going to take a lot, you know, even more than a year of student teaching that I described in a previous question. It's going to take a few years to work out the kinks and, you know, a lot of uh, teachers, uh, younger teachers are going to need to be forgiven. And that's all starts at the top with, you know, our principals, administrators having, you know, some understanding of the pressures of our jobs. Thank you, Andrew. Any more comments? Perfect. Wow. So, so doing such fabulous comments, doing such a great job, panels. Thank you. So let's go to our next question. Thomas, you'll start us off. What have we as educators learned from the pandemic that will help us to transform teaching and learning? Thomas? Um, Sarcastically, I'm so glad that I was the, I'm the first one on this question because <laughs> I found this to be the toughest question of them all. Uh, I really struggled with this one um, uh, because I don't think we've, you know, fully learned all the lessons of the pandemic, obviously, because we're still kind of in it. Um, I mean, some, some observations, I guess, are that, you know, I, I have, we've all probably had some students that thrived uh, uh, working at home on their own. And we have students that absolutely struggled and hated it. 
Um, same thing goes for teachers. I hated being online, um, not having that connection. I'm very much that personal, you know, interaction as well as some students. They like to have that interpersonal relationship and be in that same place. Um, so um, I think kind of discovering that, you know, that, that contact is important. I think is in regards to kind of how we had to teach um, some of the things I had to do was, you know, create videos for students um, for asynchronous learning, because I was at the same time teaching while students were remote. And now to have these resources that I've created that if students are going to be out, say for a long-term period or something, I have resources I can give to them. So having that as a backup, if I'm not going to be in the classroom, if I'm sick or am I'm attending some professional development, I can have the sub play a video of me teaching something so I'm still there with the with the students. So that's something that kind of I learned and 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 could use. And I actually did that once towards the end of last year. I said you can just you can watch the video and teach it or you can show my video to the kids and have just have them go from there. Um, so I think learning that technology can be a bridge, but I think we also learned that it can't be the everything, right? There's a lot that's missing um, just through the screen as we know. So that's my answer in brief, I guess. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Jamil? I think the obvious answer in a lot of ways is the technology that came from this and how every teacher in America was thrust into this position where all of a sudden we need to learn how to use our technology and leverage that to help our students. Um, you know, for myself, um, I was always at the chalkboard or at the whiteboard now in, in, in instructing. And, and this year I came back and I, I have a group of seniors who I actually taught some of them as sophomores and as juniors. So they had seen me regular school up in front of the classroom every day at the whiteboard. And then last year they saw me virtually all year long teaching online. And I actually said to them, which did you prefer for instruction? Did you like what I could do at my, in front of the room at the board? Or did you like how I could use my iPad to animate some certain things or color coordinate and really drive some, some things home? And it was a great discussion that ensued because I think all of them agreed the atmosphere of the room was better up in front of the classroom, moving around, walking around, interacting with students. But they were able to visualize and understand some of the harder topics better when I was writing on my tablet and they could actually see me animating it. And it was a really interesting discussion because I gave them, well, this year you got your choice. What, what would you rather do? And they said, well, and it's funny, it's, it's a small class. There's, there's only 10 kids in this class I happen to teach. And they were like, because we're so small, we know you already. I think the iPad is better. But if we had you new, we'd want you walking around and interacting with us. So it was, a, it was a really interesting discussion to hear from their viewpoint. But some of the other things I learned from this past year are are things I think we've always known they were just reinforced. And again, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's so important to build the relationships. And when this year started with the, the students I never had, or I'm sorry, last year started, my biggest concern was how am I going to get to know them? And I think every teacher across the country who taught virtually understands the black box, right? Because now you're teaching to a bunch of black boxes on a screen on Zoom where you can't see your students' faces and you can't interact with them. And it just forced me to kind of think about how else can I start to build these relationships? What can I do? You know, whether it be emails or make little videos and send it to them or anything like that. Um, so I think a big part of it was just thinking about, you know, really think how can we really make sure we're connecting with our students. When we come back the following year, we're in person, you know, I'll have a lot of things that are already in place, but can I take some of these other things that I did and, and use those to build stronger relationships with my students? And just as, as a follow-up to that, this year, when we started the year, uh, the week before school started, I actually wrote everyone a letter and put it in snail mail and sent it to their homes to welcome them to my class. And some of the kids said, this might be the first actual real letter I've ever gotten. And they were really excited about it. And so I, you know, I, I thought that was kind of fun. I didn't really expect that response. But, you know, thinking about it now, I can see how that would be, be it. So they were just really excited because, you know, the infrequency in which they got letters and that, that they were excited. I took time to welcome them and get them ready. And again, just start building those relationships. So I, I think those are the two things, you know, how, how do we leverage the technology? And what did we learn this past year about making those relationships and, and keeping them strong? Great. Thank you, Jamil. Andrew? You know, uh, Ken, you know, there, 
it was such a traumatic, I'll call it three semesters. Uh, and so many of our colleagues had really significant, you know, transcended significant challenges. I mean, you know, for elementary teachers and special ed teachers, I mean, they were doing some really heroic things. And I think we have a lot to be proud of coming out of this. And, you know, first of all, I think the American public gets more than ever that teaching matters, that it's not just babysitting, that it's content and artistry and public speaking and public engagement and public service. And so I think the American public appreciates us like never before. And, you know, another lesson that's coming out of this is that, you know, it, oftentimes in American, his, in American history, um, it takes an emergency to move the needle on problems that we've been facing for a while. Um, it takes, you know, a, a Pearl Harbor or 9-11 oftentimes for things to change. And, you know, finally, while this, you know, this has been an incredibly challenging, you know, year and a half, no question. The silver lining is that a lot of kids in America now know how to check their email. They have a laptop. Their districts are providing them Wi-Fi. And I know there's still a massive digital divide in, in you know, a, a, among students of color in inner cities and in rural districts like where I teach. But after three semesters of this, we are far better suited to equip our students with those 21st century skills. I mean, it's, you know, I use this phrase, it's criminal, you know, perhaps too often, but we were graduating kids for years without teaching them how to check their emails, which is maybe the most important 21st century skill. So I think a lot of good has come out of this that hopefully will be appreciated over time. And perhaps the biggest one is that state tests were canceled and the world kept spinning and the kids were okay. And, you know, it's one of those things that we've been cramming too much content down their throats. You know, in social studies, the old, old adage, you know, from Plato to NATO, that got, that got trimmed down. And, you know, guess what? I think our students were better off for it. And I'd like to see our society realize the good that came out of the pandemic and how can we keep that momentum going on the things that worked. And lastly, I think we also learned, Ken, that one size doesn't fit all, that remote learning may be a really preferable option, especially at a middle school level for kids who are, are teased, are bullied. You know, uh, I talked to a lot of our LGBTQ plus students. They said they actually preferred learning from home because it was a safer environment, which also says a lot about our current condition of schools. But to offer that option, I think, would be very appealing and, and a lesson um, that, you know, we should put into practice, perhaps. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Melissa? Yes, uh, the pandemic helped us see a lot of things. Uh, for instance, uh, in Memphis, we saw the disparity among our black and brown students. For instance, when the pandemic happened, our students did not have devices. And so school could not go on for them. And so we're working hard to address equity, I think, around the country to ensure that all students have access to education. Uh, also, I learned that my students had a lot of things at home that could distract them uh, because we could see into their homes through remote learning. And so it has made me very compassionate uh, uh, in, in, with teaching. And so I try to create an environment now that's peaceful and calm where students can learn. And so SEL is very important. Uh, we just don't need to teach that in the morning. We need to teach that all day long giving students a chance to work through uh, some trauma and to uh, help with address mental health. Uh, we also need to integrate uh, more with technology in our content uh, areas. So blending learning is very important because when my students went home, um, when the pandemic happened, I was nervous. I was like, will they know how to navigate uh, the computer? Will they be good digital citizens? 
And so all these things I thought about, did I, did I teach them those things? And so now I teach them with a need of urgency because even though we're face to face right now, I don't know what could happen uh, in the next month or two. And so I'm making sure that my little ones, my babies know how to navigate different uh, apps uh, on the computer to make sure that they are successful. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Donna? Well, there's two things I'd like to add and every, all the comments are wonderful. Uh, one of the things is I really believe that the pandemic and having to teach virtually actually enhanced our ability and made us more sensitive to differentiation to the individual student because teachers had to really focus on that just each student individually to a greater depth than when you're in a classroom you can see you can make those connections you can tell maybe either you know body language or you know other ways but when you had to work virtually you really had to focus and dig in and look at is that student really understanding and how can i differentiate the instruction virtually for them and I saw teachers do some tremendous things just to try to provide that type of instruction virtually for all different types of learners. And that's very difficult, but uh, I saw teachers just go above and beyond. I've known teachers have done that for a while, but when it came to the pandemic, there are some amazing things that teachers did throughout the country. And I think that they just want all students to have that opportunity to learn despite where their starting point is and what type of learner they are. And I think that we really did a great job in that area. The second thing is I've always really um, encouraged my stu students to be globally minded. And um, so several times my students have traveled with me to Kenya on you know different types of projects to help those that are in need. And um, I feel like this, because we're all so familiar with technology, that we're able to ask, access other communities globally like we weren't before. And people are not as intimidated by that. And um, so I think that is our learning now extends through technology way outside our classrooms and way outside of our country. And those formats are there and those connections are there. And I just think it's fantastic for our students because they're learning about different cultures. They're, they're, um, they're going to be um, so much more prepared for the type of world that they are entering. So I think that's a positive that came out of the pandemic. Right, thank you, Donna. So all five uh, of you inductees have had a chance to, to answer the question. Any other comments that you'd like to make? I will just uh, add on that uh, uh, kind of the the idea that Melissa brought up about that equity issue. I was so very thankful for the money that we received through this award through the College Football Playoff Foundation. I was able to buy supplies that I sent home to the remote students. Mm -hmm. I remember teaching one day in particular, I had a student say, Mr. Neb, I don't have a piece of paper to do my artwork on didn't have a piece of paper. So we were kind of brainstorming, okay, what could they do it on until then I could get supplies home. Um, so it really kind of brought to life um, that idea that, boy, you'd think they'd have a piece of paper to, you know, even up. Mm -hmm. So I was very appreciative of that and being able to do that for them. Uh, any other comments? All right, well then let's proceed to our next question. Jamil, you'll get us started. How do you model respect for your students and how do you get your students to demonstrate respect for all students in your school? Jamil? Yeah, I think respect for me with my students starts in making sure each and every one of my students know that they that I believe in them, that I, I think they can be successful. I, I want to empower them, I want them to feel like they're they're a part of a team when we're working together, because if if we're teammates, we look at each other and we want each other to be successful. And you're not going to disrespect a teammate who's working together with you. You want to help them. You want to, you want to build them up. You want to help them grow. And you want to help them get better. 
Um, I think a big part of that in my, in my class in particular, teaching mathematics, is trying to give students confidence. Uh, when they feel better about where they are themselves, they are able to interact with other students better and, and help other students. So a lot of a lot of that comes down to building confidence. You know, we have a saying in my class. It says, "I'm not afraid of the equation. The equation is afraid of me." Because so many students just get you know, like a deer in headlights when they see these problems, they, they don't know where to start and they start feeling really defeated. And when you start feeling defeated, you start getting discouraged and then your attitude changes and then it's all kind of a, a snowball effect from there. So for, for, for my class, what we want to do is we want to just make sure they're confident and that doesn't mean they always know the answer, but that means they know that if they work at it, they can get the answer. And I think that, that what I want to do for all my students is that belief in them translates to the fact that I respect them as human beings. I respect them as individuals. I respect the fact that they have abilities and intelligence and that I want them to, to take all those things and grow and become better. And then I think it's a trickle down because once they feel start feeling better about it themselves, now they want their other classmates. They, they want to see their other their, their classmates get that same feeling. So that's what I try to do with them. And I hope it's successful. I hope that it, it, it kind of permeates our, our, our classroom together. Thank you, Jamil. Andrew? You know, the, the, the uh, phrase came to me while preparing for this question, Ken, that our students will become who we are. And if we're tolerant, if we're respectful, if we're loving, if we're smiling, if we're forgiving, guess what? They will be too, not just to their peers, but to their families and to for decades to come in our society. So, it, you know, it all goes back to teacher selection. We need to make sure that the people who we're selecting to work with our future uh, have those character traits. And admittedly, we're asking a lot, but the stakes are high, which goes back to my other point that we need to have really great recruiting of our best and brightest. And secondly, I think the thing that builds uh, respect uh, among students is our craft. And if we're teaching actively, if we're engaging them, um, they're going to get that we take our job seriously. And it's one thing to say, you know, we need to respect each other. But I think the biggest way we show respect is by being really good at what we do, engaging them. And then when they're hooked, of course, loving them and showing them the skills nonstop that we would want them to show. Again, they're going to become who we are either way. If we're negative, they're going to be negative. But if we're positive and loving and compassionate and empathetic, guess what? They're going to be that way, and quite possibly their kids are as well, because we're actually teaching their grandchildren. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Melissa? Um, all right. Class members have said some amazing things and, um, and just made my job a little bit difficult. <laughs> Uh, but I work very hard uh, to model respect for my students. I treat everyone with the utmost respect because I know that my students are watching. I celebrate all positive behavior. I implement SEL uh, throughout uh, the school day. And I love doing it uh, with math. So right now I'm doing um, implementing social justice through math and we talk about different things that goes on and that they were uh, experience and we talk about it so i think it's very important to have a discussion with students so they can work things out to make sure that they are respectful uh to others i also allow my students to engage uh, my all black students engage with an all white class in New Jersey, where they get an opportunity to learn from people that are different than them. Uh, and that really helped because I think sometimes people hear the word tolerate. Well, you don't tolerate people. You learn to appreciate and value them. And so I'm able to do that by allowing my kids to talk to the class in New Jersey as well as people around the world. And Donna talked about that a little bit, how through remote learning, you can connect with others. And so virtual exchanges are very important as well. So that, that students learn how to appreciate others. Uh, I also give my 
students an opportunity to create their own rules. And so I don't just give them their classroom rules to follow on how to treat people. I allow them to do it. And we also make goals. And so I like uh, Harmony SEL is uh, a platform that I use with my students where they talk about, uh, they have a process called Meetup and where kids can share ideals and they can set goals. Uh, on things that they feel that their peers need to work on or what we as adults in the world need to work on. And we talk through that and we, we discuss, hey, did somebody not meet the goal in the classroom or in the school? Uh, where did you see it? And so the kids begin to ask their peers more questions and they th talk through it. I also have a reflection station. Uh, we know the kids and with anybody, there are going to be problems, but when there are problems, let's come up with some solutions. And so I have them write down their problems when they may not show someone respect or appreciation, and they come up with a solution on what they could have done uh, better, and that helps them to regulate their emotions. And so I think it's very important. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Donna? Well, I think one of the things I used to do as a teacher is I allowed my students to share who they were and where they came from. And I think that when you understand where a person comes from and uh, the things that they've overcome or, you know, their past and their experiences and their points of view, it helps you to um, understand and try to respect them in a different way. So I really am um, a big advocate of allowing people to speak and then listen once again, you listen to what they're saying. And um, I feel like, you know, respect is not reactionary. Respect is, you know, calm. Respect listens, respect considers the situation. Respect is very thoughtful. And those are types of things when, you know, you're in a situation and we've all been in situations this way for, because we've all taught over a long period of time where we have maybe an explosive situation. Um, and how do you react to that? Even as, a, as an, an administrator, not that I've had an explosive reaction from a teacher, but just when you maybe are trying to correct a teacher and how do you do that? How do you respect them? You you lay the groundwork in a relationship. And um, so I think those that's one way you model it for students. I think the other thing is um, I've learned a lot by traveling to different countries and learning from the way other cultures uh, treated me. And I know that um, on one occasion, when we were in Kenya, a family invited myself and all of my students, there were probably 15, 20 of us, and prepared this wonderful uh, Kenyan meal. And it was just, and spent the whole evening just, you know, making everybody feel so special. And when I was getting ready to leave, you know, I was just saying, thank you. Like, I thank you for letting us come into your house and everything you've done. Like, this was just one of the most wonderful nights for my students and myself. And, you know, the husband responded, he said, no, Donna, we thank you that you came to our house, you know, and that to me was respect, you know, where they were laying out and did all the work and all the preparation. And yet they're like, no, you honored us and you respected us by coming into our house. And to me, that really impacted my students when they when they heard that. That was something that you know I'll always carry with me. I loved it, and that's just to me is respect. Thank you, Donna. Thomas. Yeah, I think um, a lot of great uh, comments here today that I, I could probably just build off of. Um, but um, I think you know teaching the little ones. I think respect is definitely a skill that they have to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And so, as was mentioned, you know, we model certain behaviors, but we give them opportunities to be like, okay, here's maybe a better way to say that, to 
you know, a classmate or here, let's think about a better way to handle this situation or a different way. So you get a different outcome, right? It's a skill and we uh, uh, try to teach them um, some techniques to help them with that skill. Um, another little thing that I've always done is um, having students that represent different cultures. Um, and sometimes, you know, a different holiday celebration will come up. I have no idea, right? Have them share. They're excited about it. You know, if they know, tell me what it's about, right? Or tell the class what it's about. Or you know, what do you do to celebrate that? What does your family do? So you're honoring, you know, who they are. Um, one, a few years back, my principal um, at the beginning of the year had us write our, um, I guess our mission statement for ourselves for the year. And every year since I've done that. And so this year I wrote to make sure every student feels seen and valued. Um, and uh, so I try to do things in my room to, you know, the examples that I use represent various cultures and people from around the world, either through artist or if it's portraits showing, uh, uh, you know, the various people that exist all over the world. Um, a, uh, a colleague once uh, mentioned it in a way of kind of what we do, it's, it's a mirror and a window, right? For some students, it's gonna be a window into other people's lives and culture. For some, it's going to be a mirror reflecting back, okay, really looking at who are who you are, right? And giving those, uh, giving all students those same opportunities um, uh, to learn about others and respect. And uh, I know one, one quick thing I'll add is right outside our office one year with the fourth grade, we did a mural and we painted the words or the, uh, the message hello in probably about 25 different languages right outside the main office. So when people come, they see it and there's a connection and I'm doing more things like that in my classroom. But I think it just, you know, shows them that I respect them and hopefully they learn to, you know, show that to others. Great, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, nice. Panel, any uh, additional comments for this question? All right, all right then, well, Hard to believe, but we now go to our last question as uh, we have about 15 minutes or so left in our in our round table that has been so terrific. And uh, anyway, so, so Andrew, we're back to you. We'll start with you and here's the final question. You are participating in the round table discussion today hosted by Emporia State University, an institution recognized throughout the country for the high quality of its teacher preparation programs. What suggestions do you have for universities and other teacher preparation programs that will assist them in recruiting and preparing pre-K-12 teachers for the challenges that lie ahead, including current teacher shortages. Andrew, please get us started. You know, one thing that I'd like to use uh, our newfound microphone here is uh, the importance of teacher training. And of course, that's what great institutions like Emporia do. And by the way, I think we all can't wait to get to Teacher Town USA and see that firsthand. But when you think about the importance of teacher training, um, it, it, it goes back to content in a lot of ways. Yeah, we, we need to teach pedagogy, Ken, but you know the, the scary truth with our teacher training programs is that we, we pack a lot into a couple semesters for you know, somebody who's 21, uh, and then pat them on the back and then say, see you in 30 years. But we need to continue their professional development after that. And I think that's where college and universities can really play a pivotal role. Here's a scary fact. I'm, I'm a history teacher, social studies. And the last history course that I technically took in college was 30 years ago in 1993 or almost 30 years ago. Now, if you went into your doctor's and God forbid you had cancer, and you asked your doctor when was the last professional de development she had on the type of cancer you had, and she said 1993, you know what your answer would be. So it's not just training teachers when they're young, it's continuing with just you know full-throated, uh, you know, massive social devotion to teacher training. 
It's like right now we're facing an existential crisis in the world with climate change. And, you know, if, if I could have a voice at the table, I would steal pages from FDR's playbook with the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. But here I would have a, a teacher conservation corps with master teachers going to every American city and training hundreds of teachers in how to empower their students with uh, living on us and, and sustainably on our planet. I mean, that's what it's going to take. You know, we, we, need, we need to have a long term commitment to battling climate change. And that begins by by training teachers. And in the end, what a society puts into those teacher training programs is what we're going to get out of our students. And, you know, when I, Jamil, how many teachers did you say that you trained? Give, give us that number again. I've got 18 former students that are now teachers. So 18, uh, those teachers, let's, let's round up to 20. They're, they're each going to train. They're each going to work with roughly th at least 3,000 kids. I mean, these are massive numbers we're talking about. So in the end, you know, we really need not only to train these young teachers well when they start, but continue that professional development every every year and make sure that they're learning the most important content of today, not necessarily about the War of 1812. Thank you, Andrew. Melissa? Uh, I think it's very important to grow your own. A great deal of teachers that enter the profession re return back to their community, and I think about me. Uh, it's important to identify those potential teachers as young as middle and high school. And the district can work with the universities and colleges to help identify those students early. I also think that teachers do not get an opportunity to share the great things that our profession has to offer or even share how we have developed as teachers. And I think about when I was young and we had career fairs. I never saw a teacher at a career fair. And so I think that it's very important that universities and colleges start getting their uh, teachers, uh, candidates, or the student teachers that you work with, giving them the mentors, giving them an opportunity to showcase the great work that we do as teachers each and every day. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it needs to be a balance uh, with theoretical and practical learning experiences. And I think this will help with uh, preparing our uh, pre-K through 12 teachers, because we all said before that the, the workload teaching can be very hard and difficult. So it's very important to give those uh, teacher candidates an opportunity to gain knowledge, observe, practice, reflect, and receive corrective feedback. And so when they have an opportunity to be teachers, they won't be in shock and they won't think about leaving the profession. And as one of my uh, uh, class members mentioned, uh, money, we have to be able to pay our teachers because the early career teachers uh, don't feel that the money is matching up with the responsibilities. And so we don't want to lose those great teachers to another profession. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Donna? Well, I'm going to kind of piggy piggyback on what Melissa said. Uh, I think that if an introductory course at universities uh, should be uh, center on success stories in education, you know, stories that will move you, adventures in education, successes that teachers have had because those are what move people to want to continue in their career. And we need to highlight those, as Melissa was saying. There's so many positive stories around our country that, and so many wonderful success stories with our students that teachers normally don't brag about themselves. And that's just the nature of a teacher. They're not going to brag about themselves. But their successes somehow need to be um, out there and through social media, through some type of class so that others can see 
really the successes we're having um, across the country. And then I also think that it's very important for uh, a teacher preparation program to allow the teachers to get into classrooms as much as possible, even in the first and second year. The more observations they see of live teaching, the more collaboration they have with you know, professional uh, teachers, the better prepared they're going to be. And they're going to start to see things and um, that, you know, maybe they didn't consider. You don't see that in a traditional education. They need to be out there and see what's really happening in the classrooms, even if it's through Zoom. And then follow up with those observations, being allowed to dialogue with why do you think a teacher did it that way? What would you have done differently? You know, what other methods could you use? And then the third thing I think the school should offer in their curriculum is a class about um, innovation and problem solving because every single day teachers have to problem solve and they have to innovate and find ways. You know, how are you gonna uh, teach on a $20 budget? You know, how are you going to recruit parents? How are you going to motivate your students? How are you gonna take these materials and create the end product, even though you can't buy the expensive tools and you know materials that are necessary that you see? How are you gonna be able to innovate and make those things possible for your students? I think that that is a really big part of education today. And I think that that should be part of the curriculum. Thank you, Donna. Thomas? Yeah, I think it's um, important if, uh, and some have referenced this, you know, just to start this um, kind of initiative even before college. Uh, and for example, one year I remember uh, they uh, one of my high schools and just said, asked me to like, take on an internship, a high school student to come work with me who was thinking about going into education. And I, absolutely, but it's only happened once. And if we could, could encourage more students to, you know, take, take a look, um, uh, that could help. I also feel that uh, kind of coordinating and collaborating with other um, organizations and associations like pro, uh, professional associations or teacher unions uh, to develop programs to identify and encourage students to enter the field of education. Um, for example, there is the uh, National Education Association in uh, 2016 launched the uh, Classroom Academy, which offers um, teacher preparation students a paid residency, referring back to something that uh, um, uh, one of my classmates mentioned earlier today, um, giving that, that longer experience, but supporting them through that experience. Um, and I think it's really important when we look for these new teachers that we really look for and encourage um, uh, a diversity of students uh, to pursue education, because I think we're at about 80% still in the field that is uh, Caucasian, um, and we need to uh, make our profession more diverse, um, just as examples for all students. I also think um, uh, coordinating with uh, things like a National Honor Society, and I know different organizations. We have the, in my organization, the National uh, Junior Art Honor Society, the National Art Honor Societies, and encouraging students to go into teaching the arts because we know every area is going to have shortages. Um, and uh, um, I think, and then just finding some supports for students who need those supports, if it's just financially, to you know support them and push them in the direction. Um, who we believe would be good educators. So there's some some ideas that I would have for the profession. Thank you, Thomas. Jamil? Uh, when I think about preparing um, people for becoming teachers, uh, this, this may be a, an oversimplification, but I, I like to focus on two areas. I like to focus on subject matter, and I like to focus on student interaction. So I think one of the things that, that colleges can do as part of their teacher programs is make sure that the, the students in these programs are teaching. And that can be as simple as just running a tutor room and having students in that tutor room because that will give them an opportunity to practice their their, their explanations. That will give them an opportunity to really learn the material. We, we all know that 
we don't truly understand the material until we have to teach someone else. That's when it really starts to sink in. So if we could provide our students who are, who are becoming teachers a kind of a low stakes opportunity to start teaching one-on-one, -on -one, small group, getting used to the material, I think that would go a long, long way in making them feel more comfortable, especially as an early educator when they're when they are struggling a little bit with the content. So that's one thing. Make, just trying to make sure that they have a way to get their subject matter. The, the second part of that equation is is trying to prepare them for student interactions. And I got to be honest, I, I don't know if anybody could really prepare me for some of the things that have happened to me throughout my career. I mean, I, I had a friend earlier in my career who, who who said to me. One day, your students, some of your students will, will, will be your friends. And I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. But as, as, I, as I thought about this, and I, I kind of made a list over here, Thru, throughout my career, I, I have been to my students' uh, college graduations. I've gone and seen them getting their doctorates. I've been to their weddings. I've, I've held their newborn children. They've held my newborn child. I, I've been lucky enough... To perform a wedding of some of my former students and actually officiate it and then on the flip side i've been to more funerals than i care to remember of, of students and family members of those students and the range of emotions that we feel at each of these events as we build these relationships like i said i'm not sure you could prepare me for that but i didn't even know that was a thing i didn't know that was going to be something that was going to be coming my way and it's such you know it, there's nothing in the middle about teaching. It's you're, you're either on one end of the spectrum or the other. Either you're loving it and you're having the best day ever and everything's going great, or you're just feeling like beat up and, and you're you're feeling kind of like you know in the doldrums. And and I think people who are going into teaching need to realize you're here to help people. You're going to form those relationships and you're never going to lose them. You're you're never going to lose them. You know, I talked about Katie. I I, I, see, I still see Katie all the time. You know. This is this is a life changing event for me, as it is for for our students, and that's what I, I, I'm kind of going back to question one. You know that that's what keeps me coming back. That's what keeps me excited about teaching, and it's it's not all it's all good. You know, there, there's some there's some difficult times as well, but I think Donna, I think you said it. You know, giving teachers the opportunity to tell our stories so that people who are coming into the profession at least have an idea, because I never expected. So many of the things that have happened to me, if you had talked to me back as a 23-year-old teacher, I, I said, that's never going to happen. But sure enough, it has. You know, and, and it's provided me with a, with a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you, Jamil. And just wonderful responses, all panel members. Is, are there any uh, additional comments that you want to add? All right. Wonderful, wonderful. Members of the audience, Thank you so much for attending the 2021 National Teachers Hall of Fame Roundtable. For the past 90 minutes, the nation's leading educators have enthralled, challenged, and inspired us with their perspectives on the most pressing issues affecting education. Andrew, Melissa, Donna, Thomas, and Jamil, your broad and deep experiences have provided us with a clear understanding of how great teaching and learning can occur. Thank you for leaving us with a greater sense of purpose as we strive collectively to provide the optimal learning experiences for all of our children each and every day. The 2021 Roundtable is now concluded.